Let's get into the Word of God today as we're talking and have been talking about gleaning from God's grace. We were on chapter 3 of the book of Ruth last Sunday. We didn't quite complete that particular portion, so we're going to try to complete that and then wrap up in chapter 4. I hope we can. If not, we'll just continue on until we do. But uh, we're talking about in chapter 3, grace to play by the rules. Now, basically, uh, in chapter 3, God used the character of Ruth, and we're seeing God's character in Ruth being revealed through the Scriptures, that he revealed two ways God would use this woman to impact the plan of redemption. So the first was God knows and uh, Ruth knows and believes in God. And folks, I'm going to tell you, you've got to know and believe in him. It's crucially important. She, she applied the principles of God in her life. And not only that, but secondly, Ruth had a strong level of integrity and witness. And we need that strong level of witness in our life today also. Now, we talked about the first of two items in that particular study. And we're talking about how we pursue noble goals according to God's rules. And his word gives us direction and leadership and rules that we follow. We follow those rules. We're blessed of the Lord. It's that simple. And so the first rule that we looked at was the fact that we must operate in the boundaries of God's teachings. God's teachings are his word. If you're not following the word, I don't care who you are or what you profess to be. If you're not following the word, you're not in God's will. And so therefore, if God has put a legitimate desire in your heart and you're going to pursue it, you want to make sure that you operate within the boundaries of God's teaching. You can't go off and do what you want to do. You've got to live accordingly as God has purposed in your life. Now, what does that purpose bring to you? It brings the blessings of heaven into your life. It brings God's plan, God's will, God's leadership. All that God has that is contained in the pages of his word then becomes a part of your living. Now, the second thing, and this is where we left off last week, we, the second thing involves we must grow in the character of salvation. Now, in verses 6 through 9, we see Ruth as she grows in her faith. You know, faith growth is a continual process from the point in time that you get saved. Well, yes, salvation is, of course, involves faith. Uh, Paul said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so, therefore, we must involve that, and that's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So in verses 6 through 9, we see the process of growth that is happening in Ruth's life in her walk of faith. And she went down into the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her or told her or commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and, and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now, what's happening here is that Ruth is obeying what in scriptures was instructed to her pertaining to uh, as God has declared. That's what we call spiritual maturity. If you follow God's word, you're going to mature in God's word. You're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And in verse 9, Ruth is saying, cover me, take care of me, be my kinsman redeemer. And in verse 10, Boaz then responds and says, and he said, blessed be thou the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether uh, poor or rich. Now verse 11 says, And now my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the, the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now, if you'll recall, uh, Solomon in what we know as the book of wisdom in Proverbs, and specifically in uh, Proverbs 31, he said, who can find a virtuous woman? And that means the same as it means here. It means a woman of excellence. And so, therefore, she desired. This is where you live by faith. This is how you live by the abundance of God. This is how you really live accordingly as God desires in your life, is the fact that you're living by faith, that you're living in the excellence of God. And this is for all Christians today, just not for women, 
This is for all people today. So now Boaz is ready to meet the needs of Ruth. He's ready to be that kinsman redeemer that was necessary. Because of Ruth's character and because of her integrity, people now have respect for her. Folks, listen today. When you respect the Lord, that is the most important thing that you can do in your life is that you honor him and that you respect him and that you declare him in your living today. So then when this happens, integrity will unleash the blessings of God in your life. You'll see the hand of God working and he'll do great and mighty things in your life today. Well, we talk about godly integrity. And when we talk about godly integrity today, what does that mean? To have godly integrity today means you know the content of God's Word. You must know what the Word says. You can never live the Word if you're not studying the Word. You can never obey the Word if you're not in the Word. And so today, you've got to know the content of God's Word. How do you know the content of God's Word? Do you just read it? No. You study it. That's why Paul said, study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And so then that word starts to work. What does the word do? It changes you. It changes your heart. It changes your mind. It doesn't conform you to the world. It conforms you to the image of Christ that you should desire in your life. The second thing that happens in, in integrity in your life today, you abide in the content of God's word. So you know it and you abide in it. And I've kind of combined both of those together. But you've got to involve both of those. You just can't read it you got to live it. In other words, the Word of God says, do not be a hearer only, but be a doer of the Word. And that's what will produce great results in your life. This is how we grow in what we call the character of the salvation that God has begun within us today. So Ruth had a deep desire to obey God. Can I ask you this question? Do you have a deep desire to obey God? Or are you just trying to get by I mean, you're just trying to skirt around the surface of your walk with God. Folks, this is not running the outer perimeters of God's will. This is getting into the depth of what God wants to do in your life and how he wants to work mightily in your life today. God will honor your integrity. God will use integrity to grow you and to mature you in the salvation that you have received in him. Now, the third item is this. You must operate in the boundaries of God's timing. This is where we fall off of edge sometimes. Because you know what? We are the most impatient people in the world, aren't we? Christians are impatient. We all are impatient. And so it is important. God's timing is critical as God's teaching. You can know the teaching, but if you don't receive the timing, it's of no value. You've got to receive. Verse 12 says, And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. How be it, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Now, this could spell trouble for Ruth and Boaz. There was someone who was closer. There was someone according to the way that it was written in that day that that person would have first refusal rights, if you want to call it that. So to operate in the boundaries of God's timing is today is to resist compromise. You cannot compromise with the world, the flesh, the devil, or even with yourself. You've got to stay with God's plan and follow it. Isn't it amazing, though, when you stay with God's plan, how God works everything out? I mean, he just takes everything and works it out into his purpose, and that brings glory to his name and brings good to you. So you look at verse 13 in Ruth 3. He says, tarry ye, or tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do it, do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. You know what? That says, trust God and don't worry. Amen. How many of us are consumed with worry? I'm going to deal with that tonight. If, you, if you're living in worry, in worry and a worried life and in going through anxiety and all those things. You really need to be here tonight and hear this message. But here it is. He said, the Lord lives. He's got everything under control. 
You don't have to worry about a thing. He's going to take care of everything. So he's saying, we must wait. And also, Boaz promised to do the right thing. Hey, folks, it's just not the waiting that's important. It's the fact that you're doing the right thing that's important. You are remaining in the process of God working in your life. Verse 14 and 15. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. Now, what is Boaz doing here? <laughs> Laying barley on her and taking measures and, and doing all these issues. He's taking care of Ruth is what he's doing. And so he is not willing to compromise the timing of God. He's willing to trust the Lord in all things. I like the way Isaiah put it. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. Hallelujah. And so therefore... We will mount up on wings as eagles. We'll run and not be weary. We'll walk and we will not faint. What does all that mean? You're staying in the integrity. You're will it, living in the will. You're trusting the Lord and you're staying with his timing. And when you do that, you'll never go wrong. So when you have to make an important decision about your life, take some time. Listen, you don't have to jump at the spur of the moment. Pray about it. Talk to God about it. Wait on the Lord and let God move as he desires to do. So Boaz was honoring God's teaching. Boaz was also honoring God's timing. Now, God's teaching will never violate God's timing. Did you hear that? His teaching will never violate his timing. A lot of times people say, well, the Lord spoke to me. And you got it right in the middle of something and God was not in the middle of it. You got ahead of him. You were operating on what you wanted in your desires, not in God's plan. It's obvious that sometimes we do that. And it's also ironic how we say God changed his mind about things. I'm going to tell you, if God's giving you a direction in your life, you need to stay with it. Amen. Don't jump. How do you know not to jump, Pastor? Because God gives you a peace that will surpass all understanding. You'll know what God is doing is always right. Amen? And what God is doing is always on time. He's an on-time God. Amen. All the chaos and confusion that's going on in our world right now, the issues that are happening in Israel, the issues that happened just this week, with Ukraine shooting down a Malaysian plane, and we had, I mean, all the things that are surrounding, there's so much tension in this world. I'm telling you, God's in control. When the world is seemingly out of control, this is the time that we need to look to the Lord and know that our redemption is drawing nigh. All these things are working in God's plan. All these things are working in God's timing. Amen. Now, let's get it more specific. How about your life? You sometimes feel like, man, I just, I feel like I don't know which way to turn. There's only one way to turn, and that's to the Lord. Put your faith and your confidence in him. Stay on God's timetable and let God direct your paths today. There will be joy in your heart in knowing that you are right where God wants you to be. Amen. And today he will give you peace about that. God's timing will never contradict God's word. Amen. So therefore today, God's word will never lack from God's timing either. So to operate in God's timing, you, you have to... Here's what's really hard for us Christian folks. We have to release control. You've got to let God have his way. Amen. Don't we sometimes try to impose our will over God's will? Our timing over God's timing? Our desires over God's desires? Do you realize everything that we're doing when we do that? We're seeking and searching for that which is substandard as opposed to that God has something that is miraculous and supernatural and how he wants to abundantly bless us. And we're willing to 
I've referred to it as I've many times, we, we're more content with eating the crumbs off of the floor than eating the food at the table. Amen. Folks, let me tell you something today. God has to be in control. Amen. And you've got to crown him as Lord of your life. You've got to let him rule your life. You've got to let him direct your life. You've got to let him today show you the way which to go and stay with that path. And today, when you release the control to God, God puts peace in your heart. God gives direction to your feet. He becomes a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. You've got the great searchlight of heaven with you today that will show you exactly where to go. You've got the Holy Spirit living within you. And if he's with you, then today, who can be against you? Right? And so all those things, when you start counting all the promises of God that are in his word and all the provisions of God that are in his word and all the protection of God that's in his word and all the bounty of God and blessings of God that are in his word, you can't go wrong. Amen. Amen. So it's important today to let God control the situation and control and direct our lives. Verse 18, he says, Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will, will not be in rest until he hath finished the things this day. Now this is Naomi speaking to Ruth. And when, what Naomi was saying to Ruth is simply this. It's out of your hands, lady. It's out of your hands, Ruth. Let God determine how this matter will be settled. So... You've got to do this. I think if we could pin the declaration here of what Naomi was saying to Ruth, perhaps what God is saying to us, you've got to keep trusting the Lord in all things. You've got to trust the Lord. Do you trust God like that? I mean, today, do you believe that God's will is always best for your life? Uh, when you don't get your way, do you still believe God's will is best? You ever had God... Shut a door in your face. You ever had God? You thought you were headed in one direction, and God took you another direction? You've got to put trust in the Lord, because His ways always leads to the abundance that He has provided for us today. So you, you'll never have to doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. This word will illuminate your soul, and it will give direction and leadership to your life. So he's still working all things. I love Romans 8, 28, don't you? And we know, we don't guess, we don't hope so, we don't cross our fingers in luck, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. So you've got to learn to release control into God's hands and trust him today, and God simply defers his performance at times to teach us the concept of that will be achieved in waiting upon the Lord. So those things are crucially important. So God's desire for us is to stop uh, serving the world and ourselves and start serving Him because, you know, we may be waiting on an answer, but God is going to give the right answer at the right time. He wants us to seek Him all the more in those times that we don't know which way to go, just stay with the Lord. And we will become more dependent upon God and trust Him greater, and our faith is increased, our trust is increased, our walk is increased, and we're blessed. Amen. So your, your hope today, and your hope is, is, is not in what you think. Your hope is in the Lord. And today your hope is in the God that answers. And He will always give you the right answer. That's a guarantee from God. Amen. Gleaning from God's grace. This is what God was trying to speak to our hearts about through this four little chapter book of Ruth. And what a powerful book. Now the last area, chapter 4, deals with grace for a match made in heaven. <laughs> Praise the Lord from Ruth chapter 4. You know, a lot of times we, we really need to understand how God uses women. And women often are the unsung heroes behind any major victory or discovery uh, or moral campaign. God has used women mightily. He's used them in the word. Ladies, if I were y'all, I'd say amen. <laughs> right. 
Women, women grace this planet. We, gentlemen, we are blessed to have them. Amen. And with insight, they have insight, they have sensitivity, they have, I tell you, godly discernment, and they have spiritual beauty. So that's, that's placed them today in a place where God will greatly use them for great accomplishments today. And you read through the book of Ruth, it's like gleaning from God's grace. That's why we call it gleaning from God's grace. It's, it's receiving. It, we're seeing the abundance of God being poured out. And as we conclude this chapter in chapter 4 of Ruth, we've discovered and we've learned four valuable lessons. And, and just as a point of review for chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Ruth chapter 1, here we saw a woman of value. And you know what? Your life has value too. God wants to use you today. When the world tells you, oh, you're just no good, you, God can't use you, God said, I will use you. God today, listen, he doesn't throw the clay away as the songwriter wrote. And today he wants to use you mightily for his kingdom. The second thing in chapter 2 we saw that Ruth was a woman of hope. Our hope is found in the Lord, not in this world. And we too can have that same hope within us today, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. It makes no difference. The fact is, though, that Ruth found hope in a time of desperation, in a time of dilemma, in a time of great need. We find that Ruth had hope. Aren't you glad in this world of confusion and chaos we have hope today? We have hope today that we've got a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. We have hope that God's going to work all things accordingly. We have hope that one day the sky's going to split, the king's going to come, and we're going to be out of here in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Then we look at chapter 3 of Ruth as we've just concluded today and last Sunday. We have seen that she was a woman of excellence. Folks, why are we just trying to get by when God has determined excellence for our life? We're just trying to hang on to the bitter end. We're just trying to get through what we're going through. We've got all the catchy phrases that the world has just inundated us with to use in our vocabulary. That's not the vocabulary of God. God's a God of excellence. And God will do excellence in your life if you'll let him control your life. And then the fourth chapter today, as we're going to be seeing, is that she was a woman of commitment. And folks, today we need to be committed to the Lord, His cause, His kingdom, His work. Well, Jesus put it this way, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Praise the Lord. So God gives us grace for a match made in heaven. Now, did you know that no one deserves grace? None of us deserved it. It's the unmerited, undeserving love of God. And we didn't deserve it, but man, I'm glad God was willing to give it. Hallelujah. And in the book of Ruth, Ruth is in search for a kinsman redeemer. She's looking for one that she can rely upon. And as wonderful as Ruth was, she didn't deserve grace, as we don't deserve grace, because God's grace, by definition, is actually owed to no person. We do not, we cannot demand it. It's not owed to us. It's a gift from God. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the acrostic of grace, G-R-A-C-E. So in Ruth chapter 4, here's a case for the grace of God. You know what? It's just not found in the book of Ruth in chapter 4. It's sitting here in this church this morning. You are a case of grace. You didn't get what you deserve. If we got justice, we all would be going straight to hell with no hope. But I'm glad today God in His grace. Thank God He coupled that with faith. And today He gives us salvation and a home in heaven. Praise the Lord. So you remember in chapter 3, as we've talked about today and last Sunday, that Ruth proposes, this is strange, isn't it? Ruth actually proposes to Boaz under the direction of Naomi. All this is under the direction of God. So Boaz agrees he's going to marry Ruth. But there's one problem. As we enter in chapter 4, there is a glitch. There is a problem here. Houston, we've got a problem. So no one, there's one relative today that is closer to Ruth than Boaz. This creates a problem because this kinsman redeemer would have first rights. So by scripture, he, uh, this other relative, had the right to redeem Ruth first. Now, 
there's more than just the issue here of a kinsman redeemer. Ruth was in love with Boaz, as I believe Boaz was in love with Ruth. Aren't you glad God's in love with us? Amen. Amen. Aren't, aren't you glad where our sins did abound, his grace did much more abound? Aren't you glad that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Then we come to this issue today. So here we're talking about a commitment. We're talking about a kinsman redeemer. And we're talking about what ultimately it all comes down to. And it's the process of redemption. So then we look at what is that what is redemption today? Redemption is the idea of setting someone free uh, by paying the price. I'm glad that Jesus was willing to pay our price at Calvary. He was willing to take upon him what he didn't deserve. He paid a debt he did not owe. We had a debt we could not pay. Amen. So Boaz was ready to pay the price to redeem Boaz. Now, there are three qualities to being a kinsman redeemer, and these are crucially important. One, the kinsman redeemer had to be related by blood. That was crucially important. We're going to look at this a little bit further. I'm just going to give them to you in a bullet form right now, but we're going to see more depth on this as we go further. We're not going to, I don't think we're going to finish it today, but we'll do our best. The second is the, the kinsman redeemer had to be willing or be able to pay the price. So therefore, there was a price to be paid, but not only did they have to be willing, they had to also be able in order to accomplish that. And then that third area is the kinsman redeemer had to be willing to redeem. And I'm glad Jesus was willing to redeem. I'm glad he was willing to step down from the glorious portals of glory and condescend and come down to this sinful earth and take upon himself the sins of the world and become our redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. Our Lord, our Savior today. So we see in this story in chapter 4, Ruth is willing to redeem, be, or Boaz is willing to redeem Ruth. Now Boaz is a wonderful picture as I've tried to point out here. He's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as a kinsman redeemer and what he has done for us today. Now there are two lessons that we're going to learn, grasp, glean, understand, and apply today from chapter 4 of the book of Ruth. One, today we learn from Boaz to emulate the pattern of righteousness. Now, Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1 says this, Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spoke came by, and unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now, Boaz went to the gate, and we read about that, and we think, what pertinence does that have? What importance does that have? Well, why did the gate, or what did the gate mean in the Hebrew culture? It's what we could come down with a good question for today. It was a place that you would go to settle uh, basically your legal issues. As we have, um, well, we have a somewhat Supreme Court <laughs> in Washington that's supposed to settle issues. Sometimes we don't seen them settle issues in a godly manner, but anyway, it was like a Supreme Court that we, if you wanted to relate to something in our own culture today. It was a place where issues were settled. Now, you notice verses 2 through 6. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman Renomi that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Amalek's. And I thought to uh, advise, advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt, re wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon the inheritance, uh, his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. The kinsman redeemer had to buy the property for Ruth. 
So Boaz was agreeing to buy the property at this point. The theme of these scriptures, remember, the thrust, the headline, the marquee, it flashes redemption. This is what this book is all about. This is what God has planted in the Old Testament to give us a revelation or an insight or a revealing of what Christ would do for us in redemption, that he would become our kinsman redeemer. So Boaz was looking for someone to redeem the land and someone to redeem Ruth. So here is a dual approach. Not only does the land need to be redeemed, but also Ruth needs to be redeemed. So this unnamed kinsman redeemer would redeem the land, uh, but not Ruth. So that is not complete. That's a partial of the contract. That, that's not a completion. See, God doesn't do things partially. God does things completely. When he redeemed you, he redeemed you. Hallelujah. I said when he redeemed you, he redeemed you. Amen. He doesn't take back what he's given you today. You can't lose what he's put in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? What he does is complete today. Therefore, in this story, this unnamed kinsman redeemer who would redeem the land but not Ruth, Therefore, he forfeits the right to redeem Ruth, which then means he cannot receive the land. So here's a picture of those who follow God to get something from him rather than to give something to him. Listen, our life is not about getting from God. Our life is about giving to God. We are to serve the Lord with gladness. We are to come before his presence with singing. We are to be joyful in, our, in the presence of our God. Our life is not about what we get from God, but man, I'm sure glad he was willing to give salvation. But look at all the benefits, friends' benefits, and blessings that follow that. And then God just simply says that for us, we are to lay down, the, we are to take up the cross, to lay down our life, to take up the cross and follow him. Considering what he has done for us, is he asking too much? Absolutely not. And so therefore today, this picture today, it's not about what we get from God. It's about what we give to God. Lay out for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, church. Treasures today. For he tells us where our heart will be, our desires will be also. Our blessings will be. And so therefore today, it's important to remember, we've got to seek the Lord. We've got to serve the Lord. We've got to put God first in our life. And today, our life is not about what we're getting from God. Our life is about what we're laying up before God and that he can mightily use it today. So I'm going to close right there. Time has gotten by. We've got a little bit more to go in this, but I'm going to tell you something. You will never do great things for God. I'll end with this statement. You'll never do great things for God if you always count the cost for doing it. You consider what Christ did for us, the price that was paid. Folks, there is no measure beyond that today. That is so great. That is so awesome. That is so powerful. He was willing to lay it all on the cross that we could have redemption. And then God simply tells us, because I have redeemed you, why don't you lay down your life for me and serve me and give me your life that I can mightily use you for the kingdom of God. God's not asking for too much, is he? He's just simply asking for us today to seek first the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And the church said, Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your mighty presence, your mighty grace, and your goodness towards your people. Thank you that, Lord, you're always there, and thank you for your uh, redemption that you have provided through your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I just pray today and give honor to your name and praise to your name. You didn't have to do anything for us, but you loved us with such an intense love that you were willing to come and to die in our stead to pay our price and redeem our souls. How blessed we are. And then simply you just say, live for me. Lord, you're not asking too much because you enable us to do everything that we do. You even give us the breath in our body to do it. You give us the strength. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. I pray now, Father, you'll move on our hearts mightily for your kingdom. I pray that you will bless us as we seek to serve you in our lives every day. May it always be Jesus first. May we always today desire your leadership in our life. 
And Father, thank you for this day, your people, this church. We just pray, Lord, that uh, there will be a mighty outpouring of your spirit in this church today, that hearts will be turned towards Christ and lives will be blessed to the glory of God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You are worthy today to receive praise in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Give the Lord a praise offering today, for great is our God.